Hello there, friends. Welcome back. This video is for all the folks who have requested a follow-up to the ASMR Maps video. And there have been quite a few requests. So I gathered up a few more examples that we can take a look at and I hope that you will enjoy this collection as much as the first. Now I will say that I I did use up most of my kind of oddball special purpose type maps in the first video, so everything we're going to be looking at today is more of the topographic land map style, but uh, we still have quite a bit of variety uh, to look at. And, of course, since we uh, we kind of went through all the introductory information in the first video, we don't really need to do that again here. So with our, with our trusty brush pointer in hand, I think we can just go ahead and uh, jump into our first example, which you see here. This is a section of a map published by a company called, if I'm not mispronouncing this, Delorme. They are, uh, they're owned by Garmin now. And Delorme publishes a collection of what they call Atlas and Gazetteer for every state in the United States. And we're looking at a piece of a page from the Kentucky Atlas and Gazetteer right now. In fact, we're looking at the page that includes one of my favorite places ever, the Red River Gorge area of Kentucky. Um, I've actually used this style of map, the Delorme maps, a great deal personally because this is the style of map that uh, I've, I've, I've done a lot of exploring around the Midwest using these Delorme atlases. Um, you, you'll see that it is a topographic map. It does include contour lines, as we talked about in the last video, to show the shape of the land. But the biggest thing that makes this style of map useful for ex exploration is how it differs from, say, a, a, a state highway map, like the Missouri map that we looked at last time. In the state highway example, they put the entire state on one big sheet and all the biggest roads are shown but none of the smaller ones are. So it's perfectly fine for getting from city to city but if you want anything more detailed than that you'll have to look elsewhere. 
The Delorme map, on the other hand, is at a 1 to 150,000 scale, so it's, it's zoomed in closer to the ground than a, a state highway map. And this actually represents the state of Kentucky across 67 pages in a large book. And the reason that's important is because this map literally shows every road. And when I say every road, I mean if we look at these thinnest red lines, like these little lines here, or say these lines down through here, you know, this, this line with the blue in it, that's an interstate, and then we have the, the state highways and things, but beyond those, these thin these thinnest lines, these are all the county roads. Even, even the depictions of the towns have all of the roads in them. Now, of course, these roads are a little bit, you know, too close together on the map to navigate within the city, but these roads out in the in the countryside these show you everything you need to know to get from place to place if you want to travel off the beaten path and indeed my wife and I used these style the style of map a great deal to visit covered bridges because the the map that we were using the the Delorme atlas we were using would actually show you locations of covered bridges on the map and since the map also included all the smallest county roads you can venture off of the main roads and get to all of these little out-of-the-way places. And that was the real strength of this style of map. In fact, just visually scanning this small piece of the page that we can see here, you can immediately see that this area of the page seems to have a concentration of interesting things. See all the, all the labels and all the little triangles? This is a great example of how a map can be structured in the artistic decisions to make it easy to visually discern where you might want to do more research. And of course this is the Red River Gorge area and most of these little triangles and labels are for the arches that that are characteristic of this part of Kentucky. And the fact that the map includes this arch detail is actually a great example of something we talked about in the last video. We talked about the fact that the reason maps look different from each other is because there are technical and artistic decisions made about what to include in a map and what to leave out 
and those decisions are influenced by what you want to use the map for. What, what job is the map intended to make easier if you use it? And the reason why these little arches are an example of that is because if you notice, The map contains these references to these wonderful scenic places, but you can't actually get to these arches using this map. These arches are all on trails, but this isn't a trail map. So if you can't navigate to these features using the map that shows the features, why would they be on the map in the first place? Well, that's because Delorme's intent with these atlases goes beyond just showing you what the lay of the land is like. The point Delorme wants you to use this atlas for is for in a sense, trip planning. That's what the gazetteer part of the, of the atlas is for. The front part of this atlas contains tables about natural features and points of interest and hunting and fishing, covered bridges, for example. In fact, the cover of the atlas lists the following. It says detailed topographic maps, but then it also says outdoor recreation, places to go, things to do, all-purpose reference. So Delorme wants you to be able to use this atlas as a reference to go figure out what in the particular state you might want to visit. So even though you would need more detail to go to and visit these wonderful arches, this map shows you very quickly and very visually that there's many things of interest in this part of the state that you might want to investigate. So that is a wonderful example of the intent of the map informing the decisions made about what to put on it, what to leave off, and how to present that information in a visually instructive way. Of course, the other thing that any map of Kentucky is good for is tracing. Because if you're a fan of tracing, especially tracing curved lines, Kentucky is the state for you because I don't believe there's a straight road anywhere in Kentucky. In fact, when we visit this area, we enter the map on this interstate here, going past exit 16, which is close to Powell Valley, as you can see. We continue past the Clay City exit, You can see how the interstate runs parallel to State Roads 11 and 15 here, in between Clay City and Stanton. We continue along, we go past exit 22, which is the exit for Stanton. 
Stanton is where the bigger grocery stores are if you're in this area. But if we're heading for the gorge, we continue east along the interstate, past Bowen. There's no exit for Bowen. Continuing along past Nada, kind of driving past the area of the gorge with our favorite feature of all, which is double arch right here. See it? Double arch. Continuing past Nada to Slade. Slade is the exit we usually use to get to whatever cabin we might be renting. That's the uh, State Road 11 exit. You can get to the Natural Bridge State Resort Park by going on Road 11 here, plus our favorite local pizza place and climb shop is on 11. Yeah, a lot of our business happens at this exit here, but we can trace even further. In fact, if you want to get to some of the uh, features in the eastern section of the gorge through here, you will oftentimes want to continue on the interstate past Slade to the east and to the southeast. Finally arriving at this exit for 715 here. Then taking 715 north will get you to Angel Windows, and Sky Bridge, and Castle Arch. And then continuing on would take you off of our little page. But take a look at that road. It's like a snake, isn't it? Every road is like a snake in Kentucky. This is the kind of map, though, that you really need a driver and a navigator in the car to successfully find your way around. It's really hard to drive and navigate using a map with this kind of a detail. But that said, in all of those years where my wife and I explored the countryside with maps like this. Every time we, we left, we would have one of these in the car because it was a real powerful feeling to know that if you ran into a, a big traffic jam on one of the interstates that you could leave the interstate at the next exit and figure out your own way to bypass the traffic jam because you had a book that had every road in the state at your fingertips. It's a real knowledge is power kind of a situation. So that's our example of the Delorme Atlas and Gazetteer map style. So, let's see what we have next. So, here we have 
our second exhibit. You'll notice some similarities and differences between this map and the one we just looked at. This is a topographic map created by the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. If you live in the U.S. and you are at all involved with hunting and fishing or hiking, outdoor recreation that would take you to wooded areas of your state, perhaps even some urban planning or development applications, you're probably very familiar with modern USGS quad maps. This map is a little bit older. The map we're looking at here was produced in 1903 and it contains field work from 1901 and 1902. You can see that it is a three color map with water features in blue, terrain detail is in brown, And all of the man-made items, or what the USGS at the time called culture features, are in black. So you can see a small town here with all the roads, just like we saw on the previous map. You can see county roads. you can see some railroad tracks. This is the Evansville and Terre Haute Railroad, so named because it connects the town of Evansville, which is south of this map, to Terre Haute, which is north of this map. Here's another railroad called the Illinois Central Railroad. If you look closely, you can see small black dots scattered all over the map. And those are buildings, of course, and many of them would be houses farmhouses, most likely. And we have small towns by the name of Hepburn and Wadesville, Blairsville, Wilson, Poseyville, Rapture, and New Harmony. The U.S. Geological Survey was started in late 1884 when the first director, John Wesley Powell, went to uh, Congress to seek funding authorization to undertake the little old project of creating topographic map of the entire United States. No small feat. 
And in fact, when this map was published in 1903, the, the job was not complete yet. But I want to talk about this map and use it as a launching point for the, the things we'll look at in the rest of this video. To try to, to try to help us all understand how manually and artistically intensive it was to create a map like this. And I am talking specifically now about all of these brown lines the topographic detail, the contour lines, the, the lines that show the shape of the earth. Today, you can pull up this kind of detail on pretty much any piece of land on the planet at a moment's notice. But this is 1903. And look at these lines. Look how, look how detailed they are. Look at this area here. I mean, this there's a lot of topographic variety just on the screen in front of us. We have very flat land on both sides of the Wabash River. That's what this river is you can see that there are not very many brown lines through this area. That indicates that it's very flat, like we talked about in the last video. But then, look at this area here and through here, and of course all of this and all of this. This is really complicated and steep ridge and valley terrain caused by erosion. Look at the detail. All these lines at 20 foot intervals going this way and that and an impossible spaghetti of terrain information. Where did this come from? And the fact is that all of this was accomplished by surveyors working by hand on the ground in the field in these areas. It was essentially a, an elaborate game of connect the dots. Surveyors would go out into these areas and and establish a series of points, points that they could verify the locations of using pretty low-tech methods, such as tape and compass traverses, elevations determined with a, with a device called an aneroid barometer. And, and other devices that could measure vertical angles and point positions and elevations. But when they were done marking all of the known established points that they wanted to mark, the surveyors then had to sketch by hand, the contour lines in between those points that they felt visually matched the terrain that they were looking at. As I said, a, a complicated game of connect the dots because 
you didn't get to connect the dots with straight lines. You had to connect the dots with these impossibly curved lines in a way that was your best visual judgment of a match to the terrain that you were looking at. And remember, they wanted to do this for the entire country. And they did. But I'm trying to point out here that we take this kind of geospatial information for granted now. It's all just out there now. But the origins of cartography, the origins of getting good at this kind of stuff, is is captured here in like a in like a snapshot just one of many publications but each one containing the work of a field surveyor they even credit at the bottom of this map they they even credit the person who did the survey work a gentleman by the name of Charles W. Goodlove did the field work on this map from 1901 to 1902. Such a manual artistic process such a concerted national effort to map the country to a level of accuracy and detail that had not been approached before. Remember the, the county map we looked at in the last video from 1876, I think? Compare that level of detail to what you see here. This is clearly leaps and bounds beyond what the surveyors did with the, that crude county map that we looked at before. This is a whole new level. State of the art, I suppose, but so much work. And I think it's an interesting jumping off point. To look at how this process, the establishment of a, of a base map, the starting point, how do we represent the shape of the earth, the relief, the rise and fall, how did we graduate from field sketching to the next step? This is a fantastic example of the pinnacle of the field sketching art. But the next step is, is also very interesting. And we're going to look at going to look at some examples that will help us understand how base maps were drawn beginning in about the 1930s with our with our next exhibit So we're going to change our setup just a little bit, and we're going to take a look at what the next chapter was 
in creating base maps. So what we're looking at now obviously is not a map. It is a photograph. It's an aerial photograph. In fact, it's not taped down, so I can show you what we have here. I'm using my tablet as a light table. You can see that this photograph is on a transparent media, like a mylar or something. over the tablet and the light shines through and lets us see the detail. You can tell there are some roads and this land is near water. But why, why are we looking at a photograph? in a video about maps. Well, this photograph, or photograph like this, has a lot to do with what the next step was. Rather than field sketching contours by hand out in the field, what was done Next, the next set of techniques were called photogrammetric methods or photogrammetric base mapping. And we're going to look at some examples here in the remainder of this video about how photogrammetric methods were used to go from aerial photography to a base map to then field checking that base map and producing a final map. And we're going to use as our example an orienteering map. We talked about orienteering maps in the last map video. Orienteering is that navigation sport that I told you about. I don't want to get into too much detail if I can help it, so I'm going to explain this by asking you if you ever had, when you were a kid, a Viewmaster toy. You remember the Viewmaster toys? That was the toy that looked like a little plastic set of binoculars and you would insert a thin disc into the Viewmaster that had 14 little windows on it with 14 itty bitty little color slides. And there was a lever on the side of the Viewmaster and when you put the disc in and you pointed it at a light source and put your eyes up to it, you would see 3D images in the Viewmaster. And every time you push the lever down it would rotate the little disc and bring you a new image. Seven images in all. 
but they were in 3D, or stereo, as we say. Did you ever wonder how the Viewmaster was able to produce 3D images? It's not really that complicated. The, the answer is that each pair of those little bitty color slide images were taken of the same scene, but they were not taken from the same place. Those two images were taken from two vantage points that were a few inches apart. Ideally, they would be the same space apart as the average human eyes. The distance that separates the average set of human eyes would be the distance between the two photograph points. So then when you feed the left image into the left eye and the right image into the right eye, the brain would assemble that information into a 3D image as if you were looking at the subject of the photograph with your own eyes. Well, it turns out that you can do the exact same thing with aerial photography like this. If you fly a survey airplane in, in a straight line and take photographs as you go, and then you turn the plane around and you head back in a straight line, not exactly in the same place, but a few hundred feet east or west or north or south, and you keep taking pictures along the way, what you'll have are multiple photographs of a particular piece of ground, but taken from two different places. And cartographers figured out in the 1930s, 1920s actually, but also it became into wide use in the USGS in the 1930s, that if you built a machine that would let you load these pairs of aerial phot photographs in such a way that an operator could look at a left image with the left eye and the right image with the right eye, the operator could actually see a 3D rendering of terrain like this. Just like in a Viewmaster. It would be like they were looking down from thousands of feet in the air and seeing a 3D image of the ground. And this next part I can't explain very well, but if you want to know more about it, Google stereo plotters or analytic stereo plotters. Essentially, they were able to create these devices that would let an operator manipulate a dot of light over the 3D terrain and they could set that dot of light at a particular altitude. And they could move the dot of light around the terrain, and they could see when the dot of light would get buried in the terrain or float above the terrain. And by keeping the dot right at the terrain, they could trace a contour line at a particular elevation. So if you do that through the entire terrain 
at a particular elevation and then set the elevation for 20 feet higher and then 20 feet higher again and 20 feet higher again. When you go through the entire terrain like that, you have drawn the contour lines of that terrain. Using 3D visualization rather than visually connecting the dots standing on the ground in the terrain itself. This was the next step of creating base maps. It proved a much more accurate way to do it as long as you had clean, detailed stereo pairs of photographs of the terrain. Those sets of photographs were called stereo diapositives. And an example of one of those is what we have before us now. The better you could see the ground in photographs like these, the better your stereo plotted base map would be. In fact, I'm not sure if you can see it, but if you look very closely at this photograph, you will notice that it was taken at a time of the year when there were no leaves on the trees, so that you could see straight through the tree trunks to the ground. So the best case was a photograph of land with deciduous trees and not conifers. Evergreens, of course, never lose their needles. So in an evergreen forest like pine, you can never see the ground in an aerial photograph no matter what time of year you took the picture. But in this case, if you loaded these diapositives into a stereo plotter, you could get a pretty accurate base map because you can see just visually here the difference between the high ground and the low ground, high ground and low ground. So this is a very typical example of one of a pair of stereo diapositives that a photogrammetric base mapper would use in a stereo plotter to try to create a base map. So from here, let's take a look at an example of an actual base map that was drawn using these photogrammetric methods. Okay? So now we're looking at something that is starting to look more like a map again. Same as before, we have our little tablet serving as a light table and what we're looking at is on a mylar sheet. You can see it move. Kind of makes a cool sound. So this is a base map made by photogrammetric methods that is intended to be used for 
the creation of an orienteering map. You can see that the squiggles and the, well, the contour lines here are every bit as detailed as the contours we saw on the old USGS map from 1903. But the difference is that these contours were drawn by an operator who never set foot on the ground of the property he was mapping. He was able to draw all of these lines by hand using a stereo plotter and a pair of images, aerial photographs of the ground that he was able to load into the plotter and see a 3D image of the ground he was going to map. All from the relative comfort of a seat in front of a, a piece of mapping apparatus versus weeks and weeks of arduous work in the field. This is the this is the method of base mapping that began in the 1920s and 30s. So you can see that there are several colors of lines in use here. The, the gray lines are the contour lines that show the shape of the land, but every fifth line is a thicker red contour line, and that's called an index contour. You can see there's one here, and then if we count, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth one down is also the thicker red line. One, two, oops, I'm going off of the image, aren't I? Here's an index contour, and then one, two, three, four, five is another. And one, two, three, four, five is another. These contours are five meters of elevation apart. Streams are in blue lines. Trails are these straight dashed lines. And the longer the dash, the bigger the trail, or the wider the trail, or the more noticeable the trail from the aerial photographs. And then you'll see several areas, closed shapes with very short dashed lines. And these would be areas that the operator could see from the photographs that look like clearings or changes in the vegetation density. And these were marked in this way on the base map so that whoever did the field checking later to add all of the detail that's needed for an orienteering map, they would see this shape and double check it in the field to color code it correctly for the final map. You can see several areas. A typical reason why you would see 
to find clearings in a wooded area like this would be logging. If this property is a state-owned land that did occasional controlled logging efforts, those uh, the clearings that would result would would look very much like this. In addition to the black dashed lines for trails, you would also see black used for buildings and such. There are some buildings on this base map, but not in the section that we're looking at right now. So once a base map like this was completed, it was then up to the map maker himself or herself to photocopy this base map down into usable pieces and go out into the field and field check and add to the base map the detail about vegetation density rocks and boulders, various corrections to the contour detail or adding things that were too small to be caught in the aerial photography, all of the things that were needed to draft the final orienteering map. The field checker would take this base map and a map board and usually a set of colored pencils and field check every square kilometer of the property that is to be made into the map firsthand, walking the property personally and inspecting every bit of it. So from here Let's take a look at what some actual field work for an orienteering map might look like. That's the next step in this process. Well, now what has happened? What has happened to our nice, neat, clean base map? It rather looks like a box of colored pencils has exploded all over our map. Well, this is what the map looks like after a professional orienteering mapper has completed field work. It looks very confusing, I know. But if we just slow down and, and take a little section at a time, we can kind of look at what's been done here. One thing you'll probably notice is there are a bunch of little numbers written in pencil all the way across this map. And also, there have been some hand-drawn shapes, very organic shapes. Not a lot of straight lines here. 
what do all these represent? Well, you might remember that we talked about orienteering maps in the last maps video, and I explained that these are maps that are used for the sport of orienteering, which is all about navigating through the woods. And the orienteering map is used to try to determine the best route that a participant would take to get from one control point to the next. And one thing that the map has to tell the participant so that they can use the information when making decisions is vegetation density. Because some parts of the woods are very easy to run through and some are very tough to run through. And if you know where the tough places are, you might pick a route for yourself that avoids those so that you don't get bogged down. Well, the orienteering map uses white and various shades of green to represent this. The color white on an orienteering map means that the woods is completely open and a person can travel through at their highest speed. And then green means that there's something about the woods that will slow you down. Perhaps the density of the trees, or the size of the trees, or perhaps, there, perhaps there's a lot of deadfall. Lots of fallen trees that you have to climb over. And three different shades of green are used to represent this. Light green means you can still move pretty well through the area. And a medium green means that it's a bit tougher. And then the darkest green is called fight. And that means if you feel the need to cross through the dark green area, you're going to be slowed down to a slow walk because of whatever the woods condition is that is causing that. Well, if we look closely, we will see that this particular mapper is using four numbers. It's using zeros. Here are some zeros. He's using one. These aren't sevens, these are ones. That's how you A mark like that up and down is often how you will see a, a one written in uh, Europe. My, my mom, who was born in Germany, wrote her ones that way. Kind of an up and down mark. Here's some ones through here. The mapper uses twos. Here's some twos. And then he uses threes. And every place where he's used a three... He's also colored the area in with a dark green pencil. So these numbers are his way of marking the map with the corresponding level of white or green that is needed to describe the runnability of the woods. His zero like here, would meant to be white, open woods. One is light green, two is medium green, and three is fight. But these shapes, to me, are one of the most fascinating things. 
and one of the reminders that people who do this well, people who do this at a high level, a professional level for the best orienteering events in the world, have to not only be technically proficient, but also a true artisan. Because they are making a judgment of the shape of the area where the vegetation density is different from the area around it. So for example here, this little blob looks like kind of a misshapen potato. He's got a two written in it, but there are ones nearby. So in field checking this area on foot, he made the visual determination that there is an area right here where the, the condition of the woods is such that it would be slower to go through here than the area immediately surrounding it. And it takes a special eye to make that kind of a decision, don't you think? I mean, put yourself in this position. Imagine you're walking through the woods. And I don't mean on a trail. I mean just walking through open woods. And the woods are beautiful and open, and you can travel through the woods at any speed you like without hindrance. But then you come across an area that, that is somehow different, and it causes you to slow down. Do you think you could judge the shape and the size of the area that contains the the condition that is causing you to slow down? Do you think you could figure out where, where the change happens? Because there are no neat, defined lines between vegetation changes in the real woods, are there? These are gradual changes. I certainly couldn't make a call on, well, the area I'm standing in now is open woods, but if I go 20 feet in that direction and things start getting thicker, well, then I need to call that number one or number two. That's just... That's just an eye that I do not have, and I would reckon that most people don't have that kind of eye. But that is a skill that needs to come to the table for this task, and it's quite unbelievable. So the orienteering mapper goes through this terrain on foot and marks up their base map with their assessment of the varying changes in vegetation density. Another thing they will do will be to add additional small topographic detail, like these, uh, these very small reentrants here, the very small detail here and through here, this detail is too small to have been on the original base map, the, the stereo plotted base map. This was added in the field, and it was based on conditions that the orienteering mapper saw when they were there at the site. So that's another value add for the field checking portion of this project.
here is a small cemetery. You can see the cross that the mapper has used to signify that. And you'll see that this area is colored in with yellow colored pencil. Yellow is the color for open land. This is a time-intensive process to do correctly. A good professional mapper can field check terrain to this level of detail at a rate of about one square kilometer per week. And if I recall correctly, this project was about seven square kilometers. So this mapper was on the ground, living nearby the property and on the ground for about two months. And he produced 13 pages of field work, exactly like the one you see here on the screen. The symbol up here is for a uh, exposed rock face. There's another one right there. There's not a great deal of exposed rock features on this property, but there's a little bit. So after all of this work, after all of this detail, what's the last step to get to a completed map that can be used at an event? Well, the mapper would take these sheets. These started as simple photocopies of pieces of the base map that we saw earlier. But once they're marked up like this, you would take them back and scan them, create image files of them, and then those files are imported into an orienteering mapping software program and used as a background template. And then just when you you know, thought that there, that the detailed work might be done. Oh no. Once you import an image like this as a template, then in the mapping program, you hand draw over the template using the digital drawing tools that are in the program. And you draw all of this in the program, finally creating the electronic version of the orienteering map. And so that drawing process would include linear drawing, like drawing in these contours, but also shape drawing to draw in these various zones that you're going to fill with the different shades of green. And so what does the final product look like? Well, I've taken the liberty of cutting out from the whole map the piece of the finished map that corresponds to just the field work that we see on the screen. And this is it. You'll notice that it's smaller than the field work. It's actually exactly half the size if we tuck it here in the corner. 
That's because it is generally the case that you you draft your field checking on a version of the base map that is twice the scale of the intended final scale of the map. This map is a 1 to 10,000 scale map, so the field work would have been drafted at 1 to 5,000. But if we hold it in a way that we could see some uh, features to compare. So if we look at these areas of fight down here at the bottom of the screen, we can see that they ended up in the final map looking like this. We can see this large area where the mapper used zeros all throughout, well, it ended up becoming this area of white on the final map. This busy area in the middle here, well, we can see these blobs of fight, the darkest green. They show up here. We can see this area of medium green where the number twos are. You see the shape? How it goes out and in and out and in. Well, there's the shape in the medium green right there. can see the little rock face symbol up here at the top. It turned into this little rock face symbol here on the final map. Same as this little symbol. You can barely see it because it's it kind of merges in with a contour line right here, but it's represented on the final map right here. The little cemetery here is right here, complete with a small cross on the final map. This area through here would be something that the mapper added. See these little switchbacks? He's used these to, to show that there was a, a rather distinct erosion gully right through here that would not have been part of the original base map. And you can see that right through here on the finished product. So we might go to an orienteering event and have a great time navigating through the woods with a map like this. But think about those steps. Think about the steps required and the people involved to make a detailed final product like this used for recreation. Think of the pilot that flew that survey plane back and forth in straight rows over the terrain. Think about that operator sitting at a stereo plotter looking at a 3D visualization of the terrain and, and navigating a little dot of light in and around the terrain to draw those contours. Think about the skilled 
artistic orienteering mapper, spending weeks in the terrain, figuring out how every little blob of white and three shades of green rocks and buildings and roads and open areas should be represented so that they can go back to their computer and then redraw the whole thing again finally creating a map that we can run around in the woods with at a meet there have been so many advances but that doesn't remove the, the person, the, the need for a lot of hard work, a lot of sometimes tedious work, but at the same time artistic work. We may not be drawing raw base maps by hand anymore, as they did in 1903, but Getting to a final product like this, even today, with all of the technology available to us, still takes a parade of dedicated, talented people from a variety of backgrounds and specialties. I'm a big fan of shining a light on the work and talent and insight required to produce the things that we're tempted to take for granted. The stuff that we might accept, it, accept as a given without a second thought. And this is a fantastic example of that. Whether it's a topographic map from the turn of the century or an atlas and gazetteer that helps my wife and I find covered bridges to a very detailed map that helps us find orange and white nylon bags in the woods for fun. So much talent, so much hard work going on behind the scenes to make all of these things happen. And for that, I am a grateful fellow. I so hope you've enjoyed this second little investigative adventure through another collection of maps and map building blocks. I hope this has been relaxing, perhaps a little bit triggering, and perhaps even a little bit instructive or educational. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And I very much look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.